speak. <coughs> Yesterday, I was able to enjoy the words of God with 17 other people who are from small churches like we are. Some things that struck me yesterday was that of the 17 that were there, 16 of them did not have a musician. We're the only one that did. I'm so grateful for that. Uh, one of the, the people that were there talked about she could play well. And I asked her, I said, well, what do you play? She said, my tablet. And this morning, I just want to share with you that Faustana had to suffer through my piano playing this morning. So I know that they're going to go home and put some sweet oil in their ears because it was probably terrible. But I am so grateful that we have the talent in our church. Thank you, Regina, for all that you do. We need to give Regina a hand. We do. You know, one of 17, those percentages are pretty low. So we are blessed. We are blessed to have you. Thank you. This morning, our sermon is entitled, Anger and Forgiveness. It comes from Ephesians 4, verse 25 through chapter 5, verse 2. You know, this, the text that we're going to be reading this week really puts a high calling on the people of God. The text ends with us being urged to be imitators of God. The Reverend Derek Weber, I have quoted him now for a couple of weeks, he is admired by me in particular because he is the director of preaching ministries for the United Methodist Church. And he shares these thoughts with us that I'm going to share with you this morning. It is difficult to imagine a higher calling than that. But this is why we spend most of our lives in the process of knowing God. As we worship, we're introduced to those attributes of God. God is. We explore these ideals, not just so that we can know and worship God better, but so that we can seek these same attributes in ourselves and in our community. We might as well admit that we will come closer imitating God if we do it collectively as his children and a member of his church. If we support one another in the effort to be more loving, more holy, more righteous, because that, my friends, is how we experience God. Worship can be full of these attributes of God. We can sing about how we experience the love of God, the grace of God, the comforting presence of God. We can pray for new and deeper experiences of God in our daily life. God is always with us. He is always loving us. We can make disciples. We can make disciples of Jesus Christ for the transformation of this world. All of that we can do from where we are as a member of God's church. This morning, I want to share with us these scriptures. I want us to take these scriptures to heart. It's going to be a difficult sermon, I think, this morning to listen to because we're going to talk about some of the things, the weaknesses that we have as a church, as God's children. This morning, from Ephesians, it says, So then, putting away falsehood, let all of us speak the truth to our neighbors, for we are members of one another. Be angry, do not sin, do not let the sun go down on your anger, and do not make room for the devil. Thieves must give up stealing rather than let them labor and work honestly with their own hands so as to have something to share with the needy. Let no evil talk come out of our mouths, but only what is useful for building up as there is need so that your words may give grace to those who hear. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God, which you, with which you were marked with a seal for the day of, of redemption. Put away all the bitterness and wrath and anger and wrangling and slander, 
together with all the malice, and be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, as God in Christ has forgiven you. Therefore, be imitators of God as beloved children, and live in love as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us, a fragrant offering and sacrifices of God. My friends, today we're going to talk about relationships. We're going to talk about anger. We're going to talk about stealing. We're going to talk about working, speaking badly, bitterness, unforgiveness. We're going to cover a myriad of subjects today. We're going to cover sins that most of us, perhaps many of us, have done and perhaps maybe still are doing. It's quite likely that some of us this morning may be offended by some of the topics that come up that could well happen today as we talk about anger, as we talk about our speech, as we talk about laziness, bitterness, and unforgiveness. So as we cover these verses, I want to ask you to bear with me. Firstly, if I say something that is hard hitting, it's a little bit hard to take. Remember, I'm not trying to offend. What I'm trying to do is do my best to explain the Bible and what it means to us as the church today. And if you hear something this morning, I hope because you want to learn more about God and what God says to us through these words that we read and through the Bible as a whole. Sometimes the Bible exposes things to us in our lives that are uncomfortable to us. I want to think sometimes that I live the perfect life, but as I read these words that God has given me this morning, I know how many of these things that I actually allow to come out of who I am during the week. If these things are exposed to us and we're uncomfortable, and we need to talk to someone. Reach out to someone that you trust. Reach out to me. Reach out to a friend. Reach out to a brother in Christ. We will talk with you. We will pray with you. We will get you through this. But we have to do something about it. As we go into our message today, our passage talks about how we can relate to one another. How we can relate to one another, I think, in three ways. I think in the area of anger. These scriptures tell us to control our anger, how to deal with our anger. These scriptures tell us in the area of speech, and that includes telling the truth and speaking in a wholesome way that builds people up and doesn't tear them down, doesn't pull them down. And I think these scriptures tell us that we should not hold on to bitterness, but we should forgive. Of course, all of these things, I believe, are interrelated to a great extent. Anger. Anger leads to words. And those words can wound people. They can, they can be hurtful to a person. And they can result in, in us having our own wounds. Words in turn from others that are untrue, that are hurtful. Those lead to anger on our part sometimes, many times. And this anger, if it goes unresolved, can lead to bitterness. It can lead to unforgiveness. It can lead to, lead to fractured relationships that we have with people. And those things lead to sin and grieving the Holy Spirit and threatening our own relationship with God. So it's important. It's important. The stakes are high when we look at these things that are being revealed to us through these words, those things that threaten our relationship with God, this is important. The passage starts in verse 25, which deals with our speech. Therefore, each of you must put off falsehood and speak truthfully to his neighbor. For God, we are all members of one body. We're all members of one body. This is somewhat of a continuation of what we talked about last week. Putting off our old self and putting on a new self. We're told to put off falsehood. 
The word here literally means falsehood is to not tell the truth. And to be very specific means to lie. The Bible is telling us here, don't tell falsehood anymore, but always speak the truth. And this is especially so in our church, because this verse that Paul refers to is, is related to the church as one body. That doesn't mean it's okay to not tell the truth about people outside of the church. Certainly not. But we must speak truth to everyone. But Paul is mainly concentrating in these verses on the church, on those of us who make up God's church. And we can see, because this verse talks about one body, again, saying that we were members of one body, that we were members of God's church. We have to be honest with each other. I think if we talk about the imagery of the body like we have discussed before, can you imagine the eye seeing something that, and it's not telling the rest of the body what it sees? I do this quite a bit myself. Sometimes as I'm getting up and going through the kitchen, my eyes will see the leg on that chair around the breakfast table, but it doesn't tell my little toe. And Miss Irma will hear me howling and screaming because my eyes have not told my little toe to watch out for that chair. It's the same way with us. It's the same way with us that we have to get along together as God's church. As one person sees something, as the eye sees something, we have to tell the others so that they will know what the body is doing as a whole when we lie to each other. And we don't speak the truth, then the body stops working the way it's supposed to. We're members of one body. We start to see the church like that, then we're part of each other. It becomes then more difficult to not tell the truth to each other. As we see the need to speak the truth, I think it says here, let us speak truthfully, truthfully to each other. The next thing that the passage that we read this morning addresses is that topic of anger. Quoting Psalms 4.4, Paul tells us in verse 26, in your anger do not sin. It doesn't tell us here not to be angry. Although later on in verse 30, 31, it does warn us to be careful not to sin as a result of that anger. Anger. Anger can be a very natural reaction to wrongdoing by anyone at any time. And in fact, we know that we have evidence that there are times that even Jesus became angry. If you think of the story as he was riding triumphantly into the city of Jerusalem before the crucifixion, and he went into the tabernacle, to the temple, and he threw out, he got angry, he threw out all those people who were desecrating the church, all of those money mongers, he threw them out. It's okay to have anger. The kind of anger that Jesus had that day, I will refer to as righteous anger. Because he had a reason because he was protecting the church. That should be what we do. We should never, we should never let anger rule the day. We should never let it keep from not becoming sin. So how do we do this? How do we keep anger from not ruling how we respond? We do this. by listening to what God is telling us in these verses. It tells us to not be angry. And if we are angry, that we do not allow that angry to cause us to sin. You know, Miss Irma put $2 in the pig this morning. And she put it in because she has put up with me for 43 years. 
I'm sure there are times in that period of time, even though we've not been married as long as many of you, I know that there have been times in those years that she has been angry with me and I have probably been angry with her, but we made a covenant with each other that we would never allow that anger to end the day and us go to sleep still angry. Still angry. How do I look for 26 years of no sleep? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it has only occurred just a time or two in our whole life that we have tried to resolve those, those angers before we went to sleep. Because if we don't, if we continue to hold on to that anger, it will result in bitterness and it will result in a foothold that the devil can come into our life and can choke us in that bitterness. It can choke us in that rage and that anger. And verse 31 talks about that, that that leads to unforgiveness, which harms our relationship, not only with your spouse, but it harms our relationship with God. Do not let the sun go down while you are still angry. This means to resolve the issues, to resolve that anger on that day. You know, when we're angry, it develops and it has the potential to develop into bitterness. The difference between not being able to forgive and bitterness Forgiveness is hurting yourself. The lack of forgiveness is hurting yourself to some extent. But bitterness will make it all necessary that you hurt yourself badly to get back to someone else. There was a psychiatrist that told me one time, bitterness is not wanting to forgive you. I mean, unforgiveness is not wanting to forgive you. But bitterness has developed to the point that I would hurt myself, that I would <coughs> cut my own hand off if I needed to, to hurt you with it, because that's the bitterness that I have in my heart. And that's what we have to make sure does not happen to us. We have to deal with anger when it helps, because it will fracture the relationships that we have with others. It will fracture relationships that we have with family, friends. But my friends, even more than that, it will fracture the relationships that we have as God's body. Sometimes, for us, it's easy to offer that forgiveness when you live in the same place. But what if you have bitterness with someone who you don't see every day? What if you have bitterness that has gone on for a long time that, that anger has gone on for a long time. You've never addressed it. Could it have been that that anger was caused from something that didn't even mean to make you angry? Could it have been a misunderstanding that you have put off for years and years and years of addressing and it has resulted in absolute hatred and bitterness for that person? That's something that we just cannot allow. That's sin coming from our anger. And that's something the Bible tells us to not engage in. Deal with anger. If it involves talking to someone, deal with anger. You know, another verse tells us in verse 28, He who has been stealing must steal no longer, but must work must do something useful with his own hands that he may have something to share with those who are in need. This verse really seems a bit of discretion or digression, if you will, as the other verses around it because they're really not related. Because the other verses talk about anger, speech, bitterness. It very seldom talks about our ability to reach out and to meet the needs of those who are around us. It's so easy to take what is not ours. I have done it myself. I have been offered one cookie, and they're so good that I go back and take two more. I was only offered one. So in essence, I really stole the other two. There are times when I have stood at the time clock 
And I knew that if I had just waited one more minute before I clocked out, I would have another 15 minute increment that I would get paid. My friend, that's stealing. We do not want to steal from the body of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We want to give everything we have and give it in gracious, in graciousness. Give it in the desire to want to give that we can give to those who are needy. We have this one verse that talks about stealing and working. And perhaps in the Ephesian church at the time that Paul was talking to him, perhaps some of the anger and bitterness that he was talking about may have been caused by those who stole, who weren't doing their fair share. And so we can learn from this verse. In our society, we can steal so many ways, ways that we just talked about. I guess one of the biggest ways that maybe I try to not be so truthful is when it comes to my income tax. There are ways that we can steal from each other. And the Bible tells us this. Don't do it anymore. Work for your living. And if you're not able to, don't just work for yourself. But it says here that you can work and you can work for others, and others can work for you, because that's sharing in the spirit of the body of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Verse 29 returns to our speech, what we talked about. It says, do not let anything unwholesome come from your mouth, but only what is helpful for building others up according to their needs. It may benefit those who listen to what you have to say. You know, I think this verse actually tells us that every word that potentially could come from our mouth could be a bad word. That doesn't mean it's necessarily a four-letter word. But it could be a word that is, that is degrading someone. It could be a word that's not offering, not building them up, not supporting what they're doing. And all of us have been there at some point in our life. <clears throat> As I was writing this, I was thinking about my own, my own childhood. How many times I thought I had worked so hard to have a grade that was acceptable in school and to come home and it be a B. And I was met with, should have been an A. That's not building up. That's bringing us down. That's not encouraging. That's discouraging. The Bible tells us to only offer those words that build us up and those words that bring us down to keep them behind these lips. That's what the Bible is telling us. The next part of the verse says literally, says what is good for building us up in situations of need. In verse 29, it literally tells us every bad word from your mouth must not come out. But what is good for building up is acceptable. So what are good words? Those are the words that we use every day with one another to make each other feel important, to build us up in God's house, to make us feel that we are part of God's family to make us feel that we're important in what we do in our mission, working with God, working for God, and working for the covenant that we have made with Him. There's been so much I have learned in the last few weeks about the transformation of our church. If we're going to have true transformation, we have to build each other up. We have to build each other up. Words, many times, if we don't do that, can, can bring itself to bitterness, can bring itself to rage, to bring itself to anger, brawling, slander, the things that we were told to avoid in these scriptures that we just read. It says, get rid of bitterness in, in verse 31. Get rid of bitterness, rage, and anger. These are results of unchecked anger of anger, of unchecked conflict resolution, 
of unforgiveness, things that we keep bottled up in us that are unresolved. But things can also come out in the form sometimes of destructive words. Do not allow these things to happen to our fellow brothers and sisters in God. Do not allow brawling and slander. The Bible tells us in verse 29, we must speak good words, good, helpful words, good, helpful words that to our brothers and sisters will build them up. Be kind, be compassionate to one another kind to each other, considerate to one another, compassion of, compassion of thinking to one another, helping each other. Does this sound familiar? Do these sounds like gifts that God has given to us as His body? The gifts of the Holy Spirit that Jesus brought with Him on the day of His birth and He gave to us through the Holy Spirit at the time that He died for us sacrificially for our sins and the love of forgiveness that brought to us with His death. Build people up. Build them up. You know, we need to forgive. This is the third thing. We need to forgive, but forgiveness is hard. Sometimes when we have been wrong, or we feel that we have been wrong, it is hard to forgive. Forgiveness does not mean that we're going to forget. Because when we forgive, we learn from things that we have to offer forgiveness for. We learn from every experience in our life. But we also learn from those avenues that have met us with distress. <clears throat> we learn from our ability to be able to to, to reduce our anger, to prevent the bitterness, and to prevent the words that can cause us to sin. Now, if, something, if somebody really did something wrong against us, if they really did something evil against us, it's not all right. <coughs> it was sin. Forgiveness is not excusing. It's, saying, it's not saying that it's all right or that they didn't mean it or they couldn't help it. Forgiveness is letting go. Forgiveness is releasing. Forgiveness is letting go of what? Releasing from what? It's letting go the penalty the sin has incurred. In the case of us forgiving others, is letting go of the desire, the intention to seek revenge. It's not excusing the sin by any means. If someone has done something bad to you, it doesn't help to say it was okay when it wasn't. But forgiveness is a decision. It's a decision not to seek revenge. And in the case of a serious, in the case of a serious problem, such as that, such as assault, such as some type of abuse, then these are things that does not mean you can't pursue legal resources for them. You may have to notify the police. You may have to call the courts. But you should not, you should not forget. Because when we forget, then these things can happen to us again. But it's important that we forgive, but not to forget, because that's a learning process that God has enabled us to have. What we've just been speaking about, for many of you, is not a problem. You've been blessed enough to have faced situations that were really hard to forgive, and you have come through that. Others, others have been affected by those things. It has caused us to have bitterness. It has caused us to have unforgiveness. So I asked the question this morning, how do we forgive? What does it tell us in this verse? And if what it tells us in order to be able to forgive is to be kind and to be compassionate to one another, forgiving each other just as Christ and God forgave you. 
Our model of forgiveness, y'all, is wonderful. Our model of forgiveness is the model that Jesus Christ gave us. There are a lot of words that use, can be used for forgiveness. But I think the word that I would choose to use for forgiveness is the same thing that Jesus offers to us, and that's grace. To offer those who have done us wrong the grace of being forgiven. This includes forgiving you. If God can forgive us of our sins, then we can ask Him to help us to forgive those sins against us. In that prayer that we have, forgive us our trespasses. As we forgive those who trespass against us, those are not empty words that we just say. Those are words that Jesus Christ Himself taught us to forgive. If we don't forgive, it actually impairs our relationship with God. The Gospel of Matthew tells us in chapter 6, verse 14, For if you forgive men when they have sinned against you, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive men their sins, your Father will not forgive your sin. Not forgiving others impairs God from forgiving us. And that's serious business. That's serious business. And it, it therefore, not forgiving others does us more damage than it does to the person that we're not forgiving, that we have bitterness toward. Bad words, anger, discord between believers, those lead to a similar negative effect, in my opinion, on our relationship that we have with God. Verse 30 says, Do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God, with whom you are sealed for the day of redemption. The Holy Spirit of God. That is God. God is the Holy Spirit. We can grieve Him when there is discord among us. This is the, the same Holy Spirit that set into place everything that was required for the day of our redemption. And that day is coming for us. That day is the end of our era. And that day that we will go and we will live with Christ forever. That is the day of the end of our era. The day when all of our sins will be gone from us. When we will be able to live in perfect harmony with both God and with our brothers and sisters in Christ. That Holy Spirit has sealed for us that day. And if we're not willing to change to speak good things of our neighbors, to be compassionate rather than angry, to forgive rather than be bitter, then that grieves the Holy Spirit. We've covered some difficult things today. We've covered a whole bunch of things. Don't be angry, but be compassionate toward each other. Don't speak bad words that pull others down, but speak good words that lift others up, that build them up. Don't hold bitterness. But forgive. Hard to do. But my friends, we have Jesus Christ as our example. Mm -hmm. He is our example who even forgave the soldiers who crucified him. He said, Lord, forgive me. I think it summed up nicely in the very last verse that we read. My friends, be imitators of God. Be imitators of God as His dearly loved children. Live a life of love as Jesus lived for us. He gave Himself for us a fragrant offering and sacrifice. Verse 24 tells us as we end what we're talking about, it tells us to demonstrate our love. To demonstrate our love to all of those around us. To show compassion as Jesus Christ showed for us as His children. Father, we come to You this morning. Lord, help us to demonstrate Your great love and grace to all those who cross our paths today. 
Father, may we be ready and willing to be faithful witnesses of you and to give answer for what we believe. Give answer so that many may also come to know you and to accept you as their own personal Savior and their friend because they saw you through us. Help us to edify and uplift other members of your body in all things that we do. That we be your hands and we be your feet and we be your eyes and we be your ears and we be your heart, your heart of love in all that we say and all that we do. In your name this morning, Father, we pray. We thank you for these words to help us to be one body in you. In your name, Father, thank you. Amen. As our musicians come back to the front. <clears throat> Brother Gary, would you like to forego the last hymn and go ahead and have your business meeting? Do what? Would you like to forego the last hymn and do your business meeting? Whatever you all prefer. <clears throat> Show how much we love him. Sing with us, oh, how I love you. Is this a song that Remember, Jesus loves you. I love you. And all the people of this body of Jesus Christ love you. 